Good morning, Ajahn Brahm. Top of the morning to you. <laughs> Maybe happy and well. Thank you. Are you feeling more rested now? Yeah. A nice rest, a nice breakfast, a happy tummy, a cooler day. So, of course, Ajahn Brahm is happy. Oh, good. It your won't right last, though. Eye, your right <laughs> eye was looking a little bit puffy a couple of days ago. Wow. <laughs> I don't know what it was. Okay. It so must it's, have been. Yeah. So it's been unpuffed. <laughs> <laughs> Depuffed. <laughs> no problem at all. All right. Shall I start? Yes, Ajahn, yes, please do. Oh, somebody's mic is on. Oh, yeah. No trouble. That was actually quite nice. I think it must have been the, the ghosts were listening in, or the Nagas, <laughs> or whoever was, wanted to listen in to today's talk on this wonderful meditation retreat. And roughly, maybe my intention, but I never follow my intentions. It's strange, really, but you know, sometimes you, you see a path to travel. But when I start on that path to travel, you always find more interesting places to visit on the path. And those past places you go to visit are sometimes the most rewarding part of the path. So uh, a lot of the times when I again give talks, you start somewhere. And sometimes I see where I finish. But the main uh, emphasis of uh, this morning's talk is just on the use of insight and the arrive and the uh, what insight is and how it occurs when you're meditating because it's a wonderful thing to be peaceful and to be blissed out but then if it doesn't last and you can't make use of that in your life then well, it's pretty useless it's a nice little uh, escape for you but of course the the joy and peace and stillness of meditation leads to much more than just joy, much more than just the experience. As I said yesterday, uh, well, two days now, I said about the experience of like uh, Sambodhi Sukha, of what enlightenment happiness is. It's much more than that, because it also gives these great insights and understandings. And of course, when we talk about insight, many people feel that you, know, you can learn insight from reading books or listening to monks who talk a lot like me. <laughs> and yeah you get some understanding there but there's not you can read all the maps you like in the world there's nothing like actually going to that territory and experiencing it for yourself and that is what you know sometimes it's amazing and wonderful you read about all these things which you know you uh, can see in the suttas and descriptions of uh, great monks and great nuns you can read about all of those but then when they start to happen to you, when you start experiencing that, you say, wow, this is actually really truthful. And it's not just experiences, it's they just change your life and make you into a better, wiser person. And that's you know, what we call our insight, our understanding. And the sign of understanding, the way you know it really is insight, is that it creates a more peaceful life for you. And you know that it's uh, peace, it's calm, real calm in meditation, because it generates insight. And those two things, insight and calm, they always work together. Where there's no peace, there can be no insight. Where there's no insight, there can be no peace. So we use both of them in order to develop our life, to make it a richer, a healthier, healthier, and one which gives more service and gifts to others. I'm not talking about the gifts of money. I'm talking about the gifts of kindness and friendship, and looking after one another. Those wonderful gifts we give together, especially at Christmas time, and actually every time of the year, which uh, is the gifts of friendship and understanding and listening to one another and patience. All those beautiful gifts, which are worth much more than anything else you can put in a box and put to... Uh, wrapping paper on. These are the gifts from the heart, the gifts of wisdom, the gifts of kindness, the gifts of reassurance, to be able to stand by someone when they're in great difficulty 
and just say, no, they have a friend who will never abandon them. Beautiful gifts. But anyway, we start with the, with the calmness in our minds. And when we have that sort of calmness in our minds, it creates, you know, what I always keep going on about, of superpower mindfulness. The awareness gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And you see much more. And there's so many stories in my life, but the one which I thought of telling this morning was this, <laughs> the story of just the first year over in Thailand. And during the rains retreat, we would always do lots of walking meditation. I hope you've done some walking meditation or someone's taught you basic walking meditation. And you don't need the basic instructions, that's all. And anyway, I was doing walking meditation inside the, the Dhamma Hall in this monastery in Thailand. And uh, the floor was just concrete and no coverings on it. You can't have carpets because during the rainy season, they all go moldy. And it's just too poor to have any tiles. So it was just bare concrete. And the concrete had been laid by the villagers. I'd seen them doing it and it was done, please excuse me, with a lot of spit to actually to make sure it was wet enough and just troweling it as best they can, they could. So it was not the sort of concrete finish you would find in Singapore or KL. It was, was very rough. And that was actually good, as good uh, part of this story because I was walking meditation. When you do walking meditation, you know, you've got your eyes open, but staring at the ground, a you know, body length in front of you, maybe one and a half meters to two meters in front of you, not looking to the left, not looking to the right, put your head down and your hands in a comfortable position in front of you. And you're just focusing on your, your legs moving. You don't force the legs to go slow or to go fast. You're just aware of all the sensations which are in your legs as you walk. And of course, you know, it gets very, very peaceful. And surprisingly peaceful. After a while, you tend to focus in this moment because there's not much point in thinking about all the steps which you've just done. No point in thinking about the step which is gonna happen next. Because you walk along a path, you go to the end of the path, turn around and go back again. It's one of the nice things about walking meditation. You don't get anywhere. <laughs> you end up where you started at the beginning of the path. And I got that from the very beginning. This is not about attaining things. It's about being here, being more fully here, really, really here in this moment. Of course, it takes patience. And after a time, you know, you start to be able to feel the sensations in your legs as you're walking. And all of them, just one step, it's got hundreds of sensations. Lifting your foot off the ground, off the floor. Which part of the foot lifts, lifts off the floor first? And then what happens? And then what happens? And what is the last part of your foot to break contact with the floor? Because it was cold concrete, it was much easier to feel all of that. And then as the foot lifts up in the air, like an aircraft in flight, which way does it move? And I was just watching all of these movements and my foot, when it walks, it just lifts, but it moves backwards a bit. And I think it's just because of that's the only trajectory which is comfortable. And then it starts moving forward. And then it goes down onto the ground. And sometimes the first feelings when the foot meets the concrete, it's just really interesting. It's a new sensation. And your mind is aware enough to actually experience that and mostly to enjoy it. Because as you're meditating more and more, your attention is just in a small area of existence, which is you know, the, the feeling in the, maybe in the thighs, in the, in the knee, in the um, calves, but especially in the foot, the feelings associated with moving, one leg, with walking. And then you do the next uh, foot, you walk, and you get so peaceful and focused. But on, it's another occasion, it's um, going on a tangent, as I promised I would. <laughs> but as, you, as I was walking once in another monastery, which had a, it had a, that did have a carpet. I was just walking by myself in this main hall in the monastery in the middle of Bangkok, of all places. And then I was going very slowly because there was too much to watch to go fast. Really, really peaceful. 
and then I heard a sound. This sound was like a hundred miles away, but I could hear it. There was somebody calling my name. It was weird. It was almost like supernatural. Brahma Wang So. Brahma Wang So. And of course, it got my attention. I thought, wow, that's really interesting. I wonder what that is. And I was contemplating, which is what you do when you're very peaceful. And it was even louder. Brahma Wang So. And that reminded me that I was supposed to go to a ceremony. <laughs> and I was so peaceful in my walking meditation, I forgot all about the ceremony, all about the time. And I was just happy in my little meditation world. And a monk had been sent by the abbot, who happened to be my preceptor. A monk was sent there to try and get me. <laughs> it wasn't an easy thing for him to do. And it wasn't a hundred miles away. This monk had his mouth almost in my ear, shouting at me. <laughs> but because I was in deep meditation, even walking meditation, it appeared like it was such a long distance away. But because he was a monk, he knew what was happening, that I was just in a nice quiet place doing my walking meditation. So he was very patient and understanding. He waited for me to actually come out of that meditation to turn around and to ask him, what? <laughs> Sorry. Very softly. And it's not my fault. It's just what happens when you have deep meditation. You get very calm and just in a nice little world inside. And that little world is beautiful, which is why it's very hard for the mind to come out. But anyway, this other time when I was doing walking meditation in, uh, in the northeast of Thailand in a forest monastery, there, because I was looking a meter and a half in front of me, I had to stop my walking meditation. I stopped and just almost like froze because I was staring at the concrete in front of me. And this was just ordinary gray concrete, a bit lumpy, laid by simple villagers. And it started to become so beautiful. I mean, really like a work of art. There were different grays and just as a texture to it, I could see sort of the, the highs and the lows and the levels of that concrete, even though they're probably only millimeters. But you could see all of that and it was like a, a landscape, um, a landscape, uh, what's it called? Sculpture. And the, the colors in each part of that uh, sculpture, the different ways, the grays, the light grays and the dark grays and medium grays interacted were just so wonderfully put together. And I just was stared at it for about 20 minutes. I just stared at it and the thought came, I've never seen such a beautiful work of art as this, just on a piece of concrete laid by villages in the middle of our hall, which I'd never seen before, never seen its beauty anyway. Before it was just a piece of concrete. Now it was a work of art. And as I kept looking at that piece of concrete, I really thought I should get us a, a, a concrete saw and just cut out that section and put it on the wall as an advertisement of great art. And of course that was a bit going a bit too far, too extreme. But nevertheless, I always remember just how beautiful that piece of concrete looked. And ever since that time, I've had many, many other experiences of when the mind slows down and the energy starts to accumulate in the mindfulness. You're not restless, you're very still, but you have lots of power, inner power of energy. And then whatever you look at is beautiful. And as one of my friends who, who works at um, CERN, you know, the, the big hadron collider, the big uh, particle collider underground in Switzerland and southern France, uh, you know, great scientist, he said that was a wonderful um, simile because he always wanted to have insights, understand what the nature of beauty is. What is beauty? And all those similes which I've given about how a piece of concrete can look so gorgeous, when it's really an ordinary piece of concrete. There's many other similes I've given, which you will be aware of. <laughs> Some of them are a bit gross, but I only say that just so that you know, even there's the most coarse of objects, 
can appear like works of art when the mind is really peaceful and bright and happy. What well, that's actually showing is not what beauty really is. And it's not something, it's not in the eye of the beholder. It's in the strength of the mindfulness of the beholder. And just even that is a powerful insight into the nature of things. It also explains so much about our modern world, where because people are moving around so fast, they're doing so much, they expect so much of themselves and other people expect so much of them. And it gets us chronically tired. And because of that tiredness, not just physical tiredness, but the mental tiredness, that whatever they see in the world, they don't appreciate it as much. And, you know, you've seen me for many years. I don't just have puffy eyes. I have a puffy tummy. That's really puffy. <laughs> but also I have like a smile, happiness. I mean, a lot of times that happiness comes just from strong mindfulness. So what you see in this world is just gorgeous. You see much more beauty than other people can see. And it's natural. You're not looking for it. It's just there. Because when the mind gets strong, that's what it uh, experiences. And for those of you who've uh, been listening to the suttas, and especially things like the Anapanasati Sutta, I always want to have people recognize this, that the 16 steps of Anapanasati, if you want to look at it from the, the uh, sutta, but the fifth and sixth steps, experiencing the breath going in and out with joy, Experiencing the breath going in and out with happiness and just uh, experiencing that Chitta Sankara. Chitta Sankara means it's made by the mind. And that's what you're looking at, the joy and happiness which is created by the mind, by its strength. Of course, it's not imagination, this is real, Ooh, very real. And it shows you just when people have a weak mind, which is not their fault. It's not that they possess a weak mind and always have a weak mind. It's just they're tired. We're I mean, working too hard and not having the opportunity to take a rest. And when a person is tired like that, their mind gets tired, which means whatever they see is just no joy in it, no beauty. Even the food doesn't taste very much. Very much. So if you're a person who goes to an amazing restaurant, you've got really great cooks, and you start eating the food and it doesn't really blow your mind with its taste. You can't really appreciate, wow, that's so delicious. It means that you're tired. But if you can go, I think I told this story a couple of days ago, like me, I just going on my, one of my personal retreats, not teaching retreats, but just my own little time off in my cave, just meditating all day. And then the first time I came out, just in the dining room having a breakfast and, and just uh, the first thing I put in my mouth was a baked bean, just a single baked bean, a tiny baked bean you know, in the tomato sauce out of a can. <laughs> that was my breakfast. And so when I tasted that, I had to pause because that single baked bean tastes incredible. You know, for years, I've never tasted a baked bean like that. It was just, its texture, first of all, was just so soft, almost like perfect. If I was a magician, I could make it sort of harder or softer. It was just amazing. And the tomato sauce on the outside of that bean, again, it just complemented the, te the texture inside perfectly. Now, a tiny bit sweet, but a little bit acid because of the tomato. And it was gorgeous. And I just... <laughs> sat there like a stupid crazy person just going wow this is a beautiful baked bean and i mentioned that because it's just a baked bean that's all a simple thing out of a can not made by my five chef but it was delicious because my mind was very strong and now i know just if your mind is weak whatever you eat is dull you know, whatever sunset you see, beautiful oranges and purples and golds interacting and streaking across the horizon, just a, like a painting which even the best artists couldn't replicate. And it changes and grows and then fades away as the sun finally goes further behind the horizon. 
They're beautiful, these things. But if you're tired, mm, sunset, seen that before, so what, boring. There's nothing to do with the object, everything else, everything to do with the observer. And the observer is tired. That is when you can't see happiness and joy. Not just that, but you can't see meaning either. The mind is just too tired to see deeply into things. Which is one of the reasons why that people say, Ajahn Brahm, you only teach the same old stuff every time. Just calming the mind and just getting into, let the breath come to you and just uh, sitting quietly and getting into these nimitas and jhanas. And, Can't you teach something else? Of course I teach something else. If people are listening, all your teachings when you do this, the deeper you go into this path of stillness and awareness, the more powerful your mind becomes. When it becomes really powerful, whoa, you have a great time. And of course, uh, afterwards, when I ask people how the retreat was, you know, there's, they can say all sorts of things. Oh, I did this, I did that, I saw a limiter, blah, blah, blah. What I'm really looking for is just how happy they are after the retreat. If your happiness level changed, there's all the insights you can read in a book and make up. You can actually see or what is the, the right insight? What's the correct answer like in an exam? And of course, the correct answer can be learned and can be sort of imitated and can try and fool the teacher. You know all the answers, but you know anatta is an answer, but you don't know it's a feeling. So I said yesterday, it's an emotion, something which is real to you rather than just made up. But when a person does get these deep meditations, well, they don't need to make it up. It's there, and you can see it in the smile on the face and the happiness, the joy which is coming from them. And <laughs> oh, please excuse me because I indulge in myself when I give talks as well, I enjoy them. But one of the most beautiful times when a person came up to me and said that they had this deep meditation for the very first time, it's so cute, and just I just love this story. It was at one of the retreats, which was I think it was in uh. Phuket over in Kaulak. I think many of the people in the uh, Bodhinyana Singapore, especially Angie, I mean, you organized that retreat. And this lady, she was from Malaysia and she, <laughs> she was on that retreat. She was a very wonderful um, executive, I think, at least in a high flyer in the industry she was doing. And anyway, that she was really gave the meditation retreat everything she had. She was very intelligent, very wonderful Buddhist. And then <laughs> the last day, now getting nowhere. I haven't got any jhanas, not even any close to jhanas, but I just keep on meditating. And that was the first story to me. Okay, well, keep on going. You never know. One day it might happen. But then after the retreat had finished, you know, everyone had to get a flight, you know, back from Phuket Airport to wherever they lived. And her flight was a bit delayed or she had a later flight. And so she had an extra hour before her taxi was going to come to take her to the airport. And so what she did was to go into the hall and meditate to kill time. <laughs> and that was the first time she was meditating, not trying to get something, just to kill time, nothing else to do. Why not meditate? <laughs> you never expected anything. <laughs> Never tried to achieve anything, just meditated and just relaxed in the moment or just kidding an hour. And I always remember, I can even visualize it as a table of curry or something, maybe pop more likely a coconut water because it's hot. And she came out to me, she was on the floor, you know, on her knees. I was sitting on a chair. And she put her hands up and looked up at me. And to me, it was the only similarity I can give is like that she'd fallen in love or something because she was gushing like maybe a daughter or a son would gush to their parents. Mummy, mummy, I found this wonderful person. I'm in love for the first time. Oh, it's so wonderful. She was gushing to me, but she hadn't fallen in love. She'd had her first deep meditation. I said, oh, it's so wonderful, Ajahn Brahm. Oh, oh, it's so nice. Oh, <laughs> it's so cute experience. I'd always remember that. 
the first really wonderful deep meditation and just the happiness and joy and the beauty she saw everywhere was so real. And that's you know, how you can have the, the sign of the deep meditations. The happiness and joy and the energy you have, whoa, really strong. The opposite, of course, is depression, which happens to so many people in our modern world. They get depressed. There's nothing wrong with the world. There's things wrong with the world. It could be better, but that's not the main cause of depression. Or oh, there's nothing wrong with them except that they haven't learned how to really relax and rest, make peace, be kind, be gentle, and allow the mind to get strong, to wake up, to have some power. Now, whatever you see in this world, even a lump of concrete is beautiful. So the opposite of beauty, energy, seeing positive things in, in life comes from the stillness. Yeah, it's true that if you have B positive blood group, <laughs> no, it doesn't really help. That's only a joke. People with B positive, it's best blood group. But if you have O or A or something, you know, I, I, I've got A positive, my blood. And I thought, wow, that's really good. A positive is the best. You know, because that's what in school, A positive was supposed to be really good. Just what a scam that was. I found out later on, I tell kids, they come to me and they say, I only got a C today at school. And I said, C, do you know what that means? Has anyone ever told you what A, B, C, D, E, F means in the grading system? F, in, in school, if you get an F, that stands for fantastic. E stands for excellent, exquisite. D stands for delightful, delectable, well done. A stands for arrogant. <laughs> and kids like that. Parents really don't like me for saying things like that because they want their kids to get A's. I want their kids to be happy. But anyway, you see beauty in so many amazing things. And that becomes really amazing insight. You understand how to overcome depression. How to make a positive mind by giving energy to your mind. You see beauty everywhere. How can you be depressed when you see beautiful concrete everywhere? <laughs> There's so much concrete in Singapore and in Malaysia. And after a while you say, wow, amazing that piece of concrete. So beautiful, so gorgeous. And then you go and you know, see a flower. Whoa, that's you know, taking beauty into its next level. I'll see the sunset. I'll see the clouds. I see the truck, beautiful truck rolling down the highway. You see beauty in so many places you never expected. You see beauty in your own, your own grandma. She's getting very old. She's not sort of, she will never win uh, Miss, Universe, or Miss Universe Singapore section, your old grandma. But <laughs> when you see her, oh, that's lovely. Because <laughs> you, your mind is strong. It's not what's in that person, it's what's in you. Which means that your perception of beauty is independent of what you're looking at. It's free of that. You know where happiness really lies and how to free it from what it's observing. Whatever it observes, it becomes happy. Oh yeah, these things change after a while, but that's great because you have more beautiful things to see. If you're in a, a a, what's it called, um, an exhibition of fine art. You just watch one painting and there's beautiful paintings in the next room or in the upstairs part of the gallery. There's so much beauty to enjoy. Huge lots of happiness. And of course, it's not happy attachment because attachment is you grabbing what's outside of you. This is something inside of you. The joy and energy of your mind. That. It's the insight which we get. What is suffering? Or what is letting go of suffering? The peace and joy of a mind which is powerful and which is not attached to the world. Because when you're attached to things in the world, you can't really get the stillness. There's too many things you have to do. Yeah, you've got to be attached to the back of the motorbike when you're uh, traveling down the road. 
But I'm talking about in the times you have some freedom. Which we do have freedom, but why is it that people don't take those opportunities to be peaceful, to be still? When there is an opportunity to meditate, why do we do something else? And to be honest with yourselves, you know that you're on a retreat now. There's so many opportunities to sit still and be quiet. But why do we always you know, check our emails or WhatsApp or Facebook or whatever? I don't have WhatsApp or Facebook. Other people have got Facebook for me, but I never, I never looked at Facebook. I don't know really how to use it. And of course I could learn, but I don't want to. I don't want to know at WhatsApp. Emails is more than enough for me. And, but I prefer my basic method of communication is talking face to face. That's the best. I'm doing it on the internet. It's not that bad. At least I can smile at people. I, I don't know really how to smile on a Facebook page or on a WhatsApp or something. It's, it's not physical enough. Anyway, that uh, when a person does develop the power of the mind, the insights, they just keep on flowing and you're happy. And if you're attached to something, it means your mind goes out there and it just loses its power. If you're inside, it preserves its power. And it means that you know you, you, you want to meditate, you want to be peaceful, you don't need so much in life. Sometimes you look at all the entertainments which people have these days. And just every now and again, I was uh, on uh, looking at, I forget, something, a YouTube channel. And apparently on YouTube, you can watch all these movies as well. Is it called Netflix? I think I've got that right because I saw an advertisement. Netflix, watch all the movies you want. <laughs> I said, no, thank you. But it's like in the old days to go to a, a movie, a film, and you had to actually go there, go to a cinema and just sit in the seats and watch one movie, maybe uh, in a month or something. I remember when I was growing up with my parents, the big night out, go watch a movie. They can sit at home, whichever you want. How come people aren't more happy? You know, all the delights which they could want are just out there, just literally the click of a button. Sometimes you look at those descriptions of the, of the, the, of the Amitabha's Pure Land. Whatever you want, any entertainment, you can have it straight away. That's our modern world. It's on the internet. Whatever food you want, you just almost think about it and it comes to you. That's that, uh, uh, I think in Australia they call it Uber Eats. <laughs> you just say what you want and somebody delivers it to you. You don't even need to cook it. There are all these incredible joys and happinesses in our modern world. To think people would be so delighted. They're not, are they? What's going on? You watch whatever movie you want, often for free or for a very small charge. You don't have to go out. To actually see that movie, you can eat just the most amazing foods anytime, any place. You don't have to cook it. It's delivered to your door. How come people aren't just so joyful? And it's because the joy doesn't live in the objects. It is in the mind of the person with happiness. And when we learn that, we realize if we really want to have a lot of fun in life, we learn how to train our minds. We learn how to sit still. And it becomes, even the process of sitting still becomes so happy and so joyful. That's, that's why that, yeah, okay, you can say I'm attached to meditation. I'll put my hand up and say there's a lot of truth to that. But I've also mentioned to people how the Buddha taught that anyone who's attached to meditation, they get one of four things. And those four things are the four stages of enlightenment. It's the only option the Buddha said is possible. We get attached to your meditations, or rather to the joy of the meditation. And that means that when one perceives that joy and knows its causes, we have insight into happiness, which is the opposite of suffering. And one realizes just one wants to meditate more and more. And one inclines towards it. And what one is really interested in, what one really enjoys, you will always find the time for it. You have to, you've got no choice. And if people say they don't have enough time to meditate because their life is too busy, I interpret that as saying they don't really appreciate the power of meditation yet. It's joy, 
its health benefits, and also its work benefits. I said this many times that when you know how to have a very joyful, happy mind, and you go to work with one of those minds, it's amazing what you can do, how much you can achieve, how much you can produce. Maybe not work so frantically. Your mind is so clear, you can see insights into well, how it's better to run the business. New products which people want because you're more aware of what's happening in life. And I can say that to my own business, the monk business and the nun business in my factories over here, that we produce. We produce you know, pretty good products. As many of you have seen, it's wonderful, the, the nice comments you've made about Ajahn Bamali and his teaching of the suttas. And that makes me really happy because you know, there is a monk, you know, I ordained him and just trained him. And now he's uh, teaching and see how much he brings happiness and clarity to people. Well, oh, that gives me so much joy and happiness as well. And so that's my business. And it's a successful business. And but I don't get stressed out. I get puffy eyes because I'm physically tired sometimes. But my happiness is, you can see it. I think I'm, I don't fake this. I'm not an actor. It's real. But anyway, so you get some great insights with the meditation. But they keep on going. You know, the insights into suffering. Just why do people suffer? It's crazy. I think it's mostly the tiredness. They don't see the beauty in things. And I mentioned when people ask me about marriage counseling I just <laughs> when I look at it intellectually I thought what the heck are you asking me for you had a girlfriend for quite a few months but you know but that was a long time ago but why, why, why do you ask me about these things and of course you ask me because you get some really nice answers and one of the most beautiful answers which I'd, I've given and I don't get uh, this was answers you don't get from an Ajahn Chah you get from your own meditation very peaceful stillness. And that particular answer was emphasized by you know, when I do talk to people who've just been married, sometimes giving the marriage blessing for them. I can't do the marriage ceremony because that's not really right for the uh, monk to be a marriage celebrant. You know, it's too close to the world. But we can give some nice advice and blessings and stuff after they got married. And this beautiful ceremony, which I do to look into the the, uh, first of all, the bride's eyes. She's just been married. She just has well, gone through the ceremony. The rings have been exchanged. They made their vows and just, whoa, just how much happiness they have at that time. And they will always be listening. The two times I find when people really listen to, to the talks are uh, at a marriage ceremony, the, the husband and the wife. And the other time is at funerals. People really listen then because it's a powerful experience. So, but anyway, the, at the marriage ceremony, I look at the, the new bride, the wife. Say to her, look her right in her eyes. And say, you're a married woman now. Now from this moment on, you must never think of yourself anymore. You're in marriage, which is not personal. This is bigger than that. And she always smiles. And look at the guy and say the same thing. You're a married man now. You mustn't think of yourself. And he agrees as well. And then I still looking at the guy, say to him, and from this moment on, you're a married man. You must never think of her, your wife. Don't think of her from this moment on. And I love these moments. I mean, you've all heard this story before, so you know what the punchline is. It's not a, a joke punchline. It's a powerful, deep punchline. <laughs> and he gets confused. I, maybe I'm, I love torturing people. I don't know. Maybe I'm a sadist. I don't know. But he's not really a sadist because I'm giving them lots of happiness for a long, long time. But anyway, he gets confused. Look at the wife. And from this moment on, you must not think of your husband. And she says, total confusion. She's open enough to listen to this and realize it's something important, but she doesn't understand exactly what it means. And that's, I leave them like that for maybe 10, 20 seconds. And then I give them the answer. 
said, once you're married, it's never about yourself. It's never about your partner. It's about us. The third options of life, about us. And they get it <laughs> because they're open and they realize, oh yeah, if I just think of myself, that's just so selfish. If I think of my partner, I just get burnt out. There's nothing in it for me. It's just like that stupid dichotomy of Hinayana and Mahayana in Buddhism. Hinayana is getting enlightened for yourself. Mahayana, sacrificing yourself to help all others. Both are wrong. They're both stupid. That Buddhism is not about your own enlightenment or about helping others. It's about helping us. You're in it together. So you know, in any relationship, it's never about you, never about the other. It's always about the relationship between the two of you, about us. That's like beauty. You have a powerful mind, you have a good relationship within a block of concrete. In meditation, it's not about my meditation object, it's not about the observer, mindfulness, it's what's between us. And if it's, no, this is not good enough, I want it to be better. Or this is wonderful, I want it to stick around a long time. Then you're going to have difficulty meditating. But if you put this wonderful just peace, kindness and gentleness between you and whatever you're observing in meditation, then you're on the path. Things are going to happen. It's a simple thing to do, putting peace, kindness, and gentleness between you and whatever you're observing in meditation. It's just, a lot of time, it's doing nothing. It's peace, letting this moment be. But looking at it with kindness and gentleness. If I could add another word, to be patience as well. And of course, that all comes from the second factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. And then you get insight into what that factor really means because you're practicing it, it's real and it works. It works amazingly well. Or the same, you have sickness in your body or chronic pain or cancers and you're dying. These are real problems in our world. And if meditation could only work when you're healthy and strong or young, meditation wouldn't be worth very much. But when you're old and sick, you have pains, we really quite a lot of pain and feel very, very low energy physically. I'm not talking about mental energy, I'm talking about physical energy and the, the tiredness of sickness. Now, what do you do? You're observing the sickness, being with it with peace, kindness, and gentleness. You can always make peace with sickness. You can actually always make peace with pain. If you trust that that's possible, then it becomes possible. You have pain, but you're at peace with it. You're being kind to it. You're not trying to get rid of it. You're caring for it. You haven't got negativity towards it. You're not stigmatizing it. You're not saying that something is wrong. I'm sick. It's one of the reasons why my teachings are pretty consistent. Always tell people when you go see the doctor, don't go to the doctor and say there's something wrong with me, doctor. You know, I've got COVID, something wrong. It's, it's okay, it's right to be sick. It's part of life. Don't stigmatize illness. Like we, you know, sometimes in the past, and apparently still doing that in places like Malaysia and Singapore, it's like stigmatizing being gay. It's not your fault. No one make a mistake. It's part of life. Some people are gay. Some people are lesbian, transgender. That's their nature. Even in the animal world, it's the same. So it's just almost denying the truth of the world to stigmatize people who are gay or lesbian, transgender, whatever. And the same with stigmatizing illness. There's something wrong with me. I've got to get rid of this illness no matter what. And of course, to me, that's always been so counterproductive. Instead, no, it's right to be sick. It's okay. Uh, my own insight into that. 
oh, I don't know why these things happen to me, but being a monk for quite a few years and just teaching in the local prison. We all know I did that for quite a while. And I, I don't know what it was. There was a period, I think my 17th range retreat, I think it was, I got really weak, you know, low physical energy. And I didn't know what it was. So I went to the doctor and went to other people to try and find out, you know, what's wrong with me. I was just really, really tired. And I was sitting in the doctor's surgery, as you do. And I was sitting there feeling really down because of my low energy. And I, I, actually, I, my meditation did fix it in the end. But anyway, that's another story. So then sitting in the doctor's surgery, one of the prison officers came in, who I knew from my visits to the, his prison. And he came there and looked at me and stared at me and said to me these words, which I'll never forget, Ajahn Brahm, I never expected to see you in a place like this. <laughs> and I, he was actually like he caught me in like in a pub or in a brothel or someplace where monks should never go. And I said, well, I'm, I'm only in the doctor's surgery <laughs> waiting for an appointment. <laughs> But he thought, well, monks don't get sick. So, you know, if you're sitting in a doctor's surgery, bad, bad, Ajahn Brahm, bad, you're sick. <laughs> Thinking that there's something wrong if you're sick. <laughs> I remember that. First of all, I felt really ashamed. And I thought, what am I ashamed of? It's only sickness. Haven't I got the right to be sick as well? I demand monks' rights to be sick. <laughs> anyway. In the end, I stopped stigmatizing my sickness and illness and just did a bit of meditation and it just passed away by itself. I never knew what it was, but anyway, it's a nice experience. So there's nothing wrong with these things. So we get insight in what's right and what's wrong. And it's goodness, badness, right or wrong, depends on not how you're feeling or who you are, what's happening in the world. It depends on your reaction to what's happening in the world, your relationship to your sickness, your relationship to being gay, your relationship you know, to being old and having cancer. What are you learning from that relationship? The cancer's there and you know, you're experiencing it. How are you experiencing it? So if I was a doctor, an oncologist, yeah, there's a the cancer. Now, how do you react to this? Are you really learning how to make peace, be kind, be gentle? And you know, changing your reaction to it, the way you look at it. Your body, what's your relationship with your body? How are you making use of it? Your meditation, what's your relationship to what you're experiencing when you close your eyes and meditate? Are you making peace and being kind, being gentle? And that relationship you have, that is what eases suffering, creates beautiful peace and happiness, a powerful mind, and a release from the world. And these are powerful insights. If you know, you look at the, the hindrances, or what we sometimes call the poisons of like greed, hatred, and delusion. What are those poisons? Greed, hatred, and delusion. It is just you know, how one relates to the experiences in life with greed, with wanting, or with ill will, wanting to get rid of, or delusion, just not really understanding them. It's the relationship which you have you know, with the experiences of life. Those are called, when they're wrong relationships, they need to be tuned up and adjusted. That is called the three classes what sometimes people call the poisons, you know, which cause the group cause of trouble in the world. And so little by little one gets a powerful mind that sees these things. A lot of the time you see them for yourself. And of course I read suttas when I was young. I listened to some great teachers of meditation, people like Ajahn Chah. This weird, all these times they taught, I thought I knew better. And so, yeah, it was interesting, but I still follow my old bad habits. And I want to make sure I 
get the toilet break at the right time today. <laughs> yes, and I went on a bit too long. I'm sorry about that. But I'm going to finish off with this wonderful insight from Ajahn Chah, and which I never understood for years. And I think, where did I? That's right. I, I, I needed to share this insight with people. And I didn't know where I could put it, in which book I wrote. So I actually put it in the Good, Bad, Who Knows book, you know, the second of the story books. And it doesn't really belong there. It's, it's a much more powerful story than belongs in, the, in that particular book. But nevertheless, it was in there somewhere. But it was what I remember the first year, maybe first six months, when I was with Ajahn Chah in his monastery, Wat Bapong. He listened to his talks and he would repeat the same story many times. And then he'd move on to another story. And sometimes you'd come back to that old story, but this story he never came back to. In all the years I knew him, it was only just that first year I was there that he would mention this story. And it was the story of the mango trees. He said his monastery was a mango orchard and the mango trees have been planted by the Buddha himself. And as soon as he said that, I, I didn't appreciate this was a simile. I thought this is a crazy monk. And I often I thought my teacher Ajahn Chah was crazy. It took years to really appreciate the depth of his wisdom and the power of his compassion. But anyway, he said, Wat Bapan was a mango orchard and all the trees been planted by the Buddha. And they're special mangoes because even so many hundreds of years later, each of those mango trees has got so many ripe mangoes on them. Now remember that time was just living on sticky rice and frogs or all these, what was it, um, bamboo shoot uh, curries and stuff and just really not the sort of stuff I liked. But I love mangoes. Especially mango and sticky rice. Oh, that was amazing. But anyway, so I, I was really interested in ripe mangoes. And he said, the only way you can get those mangoes from that tree, you can't climb the tree, you can't throw sticks at the tree or shake the tree. There's only one way to get mangoes from the trees planted by the Buddha. He said, that is to sit perfectly still underneath one of those mango trees, and then hold out your hand. And a mango will fall into your hand from the compassion of the Buddha. Crazy, that would never happen, not to me. But then you realize the simile. He said, for those of you who want deep insights, and real insights, powerful insights into the nature of happiness, the nature of relationships you have with other people, with yourself, with the world, with COVID, you know, with business, with family, with money, with your own eventual death, rebirth, all of those great insights. They will only come if you sit perfectly still. You don't go chasing insights. You don't go throwing a stick up at the Bodhi tree, hoping some wisdom will fall. You sit perfectly still. And opening your hand was, that was the most amazing part of that simile. Opening your heart, compassion, kindness. And when you have the compassion, the kindness, and the stillness, then all these mangoes fall. Gorgeous mangoes. This is, oh, this is happening to me. You're experiencing these deep meditations, these great insights, memories of your past lives and enlightenment experiences. Whoa. And then you look back upon your teacher, three bows. Oh, thank you, Ajahn Chah. You really understood. Those are the insights which happen. The insights which bring you real happiness appreciation of joy, freedom from the, from pain, from deep pain, from chronic pain, from depression, freedom from losing all sort of hope in life, which sometimes people do. Freedom, peace, joy. 
So there we go. That's the talk on inside this morning. Many things you can talk about as well, but that's the 55 minutes. So now, freedom from the pain in your bladder. <laughs> in order to overcome that suffering, go to the toilet. The relieving mechanisms of the toilet are available to you. Free of charge, no extra cost. So off you go. <laughs> and have a toilet break. And thank you for listening to this crazy monk. <laughs> Okie dokie. Afterwards we have the uh, guided meditation or something. Oops. So, I just was sometimes a bit worried about being too silent when we're on things like a Zoom conference. So, oh, you, you, you want me to do a walkthrough of a day of your life, I think sometimes. You know, I, I pretty well, my days are just, every day is different. But I remember just, <laughs> Just uh, one of my talks I gave, which was apparently the most popular talk, you know, quite a few million copies downloaded, was that the talk on called Letting Go. It's a YouTube talk, Let, Letting Go. And on there, there was a story of one of my monks who went to one of the prisons to teach. And they asked him, what does a monk do? And uh, what's the life of a monk? And they gave, I gave this wonderful um, little simile for them afterwards about how a monk lives his life. And when they were told, the prisoners were told what the life of an Ajahn Brahma or any other monk is, a daily routine. The prisoners, this was in a, a top security jail in Perth, they were stunned. They were just so amazed. They said that your life is so much more hard than ours. And we're prisoners. We don't have to get up at four o'clock in the morning. I jumped wrong. What crime did you do to have to get up that early? <laughs> we only have to do solitary confinement when we do something wrong. You do it voluntarily. What's wrong with you guys? We eat three or four meals a day. You only do one a day. Anyway, but because of that, <laughs> the crunch answer to that question of a monk's lifestyle was it was more ascetic, more uncomfortable than the life of a prisoner in Australia. Well, why is it then that there's a waiting list of people trying to join a monastery? There's a waiting list of people trying to leave the prison. What's the difference? And the answer was that the prison is a place you don't want to be. Any place you don't want to be is your prison. If you're in like a five-star hotel somewhere in Singapore. You don't really want to be there today, but you have to be there for some reason or another. Then a five-star hotel becomes a prison for you. If you're enjoying your life in jail, and some people do that, then you're free. Freedom is wanting to be here. Not wanting to be anywhere else in the whole world. Then you're free. And that's how we practice as monks. I sleep on the floor. Sometimes I eat food which I don't like. 
sometimes not much entertainment except jokes and watching sunsets and uh, bits of concrete on the floor. <laughs> Crazy entertainment, it's all for free. I want to be here because I want to be here. That's when I'm free. And that became so powerful. You know, people feel freedom is escaping. Now freedom is being here. Anyway, I will wait for another minute or two and then we'll start the guided meditation. Yeah. yeah. Do you remember the baby was born straight away and sit cross-legged? You know oh, what happened? Yeah. Yeah, no, I don't know what happened afterwards. Because uh, a lot of times uh, the, the mothers don't want anything special uh, related to their children because it you know, makes people just do experiments on their children or do videos of their children. They want their children to have a normal life. But for those who don't know that story, the people tell, tell me some incredible stories. You know, that, and these are parents who, you know, they're not lying to me. They've got nothing to gain at all. There's no reason for them to lie. And you can tell by their expressions. They're not trying to, to do anything except tell the truth and ask a monk, please explain. This is really causing us suffering. But uh, my baby, after a few weeks, I don't know, just a couple of weeks, started talking. They actually had a conversation with us. <laughs> What's going on, Ajahn Baba? Are we going mad? Because it's a couple, and they're just ordinary people, ordinary young Australian parents. They say these things, and wow, this particular woman <laughs> just given birth, and she's still in the hospital, the maternity ward, and the baby just you know, had its meal, you know, sucking the milk in the breast. And after it taken what it wanted, the little baby just caught on its mother's tummy. And the mother was just leaning up a bit so you could see a little bub then cross its legs in full lotus put its hands the one hand over the other straight back close its eyes and looked like it was a perfect meditation posture it was quiet for a few minutes and that just again freaked the mum out how on earth did the baby learn that maybe you could explain it learned it while it was in the mother's womb the mother would meditate. But how the baby did that by itself, it must have been more than just experience of watching his mum do that. It must have been something from his previous life. Or you ate a nice meal. Now what do you do? Meditate. Yeah. That's a very smart baby. But what happened to her afterwards, I don't know. I've always wonderful stories. I remember going to this art exhibition in Sydney. They're having an art exhibition on Buddhism. And this was 11 year old kid. He, was, he literally was dragging his mum, holding her hand and dragging her to come and see me and pay respects. His mum said, look, I had to bring my kid here. I didn't want to, I'm not a Buddhist, but my kid insisted, insisted, and he dragged me here. He said, hey, I had to go. It was the weirdest thing. And I said, well, Probably he was a monk before, and this is just remembering all of that. And he was just so engrossed in the exhibition. And you know, when you have kids like that, you go, what can I do for them? But I remember I had this, this expensive exhibition guide, a big book with all the paintings, and it must have been worth a lot of money. And of course, what do I need a book like that for? So I said, this is for you, little one for you to enjoy for me, the gift which I can give to you. His eyes lit up. And of course, that was the greatest gift I got from that little um, visit. See a little 11 year old, Aussie guy, Aussie boy, this Aussie mum, just, just be so um, in, joyful to meet a monk and a kind monk who would give him some encouragement. Again, I don't know what ever happened to him. But every now and again, you meet this guy Many years ago, you meet somebody and they're grown up and they come to meditate or something and say, do you remember me? <laughs> you say, no, who are you? He said, I'm, well, I was an 11 year old guy, a boy, he gave me a book to. <laughs> so anyway, those are wonderful experiences of life, being a monk who gets out there. So anyway, let's do some meditation. Otherwise we 
it'll be <laughs> time for me to have lunch before I even start my meditation. So anyway, here we go. A nice guided meditation. And same old meditation, but putting a bit more emphasis on what I've just been talking about. So please close your eyes. And with your eyes closed, bring awareness onto your body. Where are your feet now? I really make sure my feet are comfortable. I do this when I go to sleep at night. So I can start the process of going to sleep with a really comfortable body. Because I care for my body, it's important to me. It's my vehicle. And I just make sure it's always well looked after. <laughs> Feel my feet, my legs. Go to my knees again. So anytime I really notice my knees is when I meditate, because they're always just really, really, really well behaved. You know, there's one thing which I've noticed I've never broken a bone in my body as far as I know. So my whole life, I've fallen off ladders and came crashing down to the ground, great heights, but nothing broke. Very fortunate. I've got my legs, past my knees. As I'm aware of them, I always check my relationship with them. I'm not exploiting you, knees. I'm your friend. We work together. Anything you need, please let me know. And I just do final adjustments to my legs. And they know I, I honestly care for them. You know you're cared for. That gives you a lot of peace. And my legs know they're cared for. Gives them some peace. I go to my butt. Feels quite good. So I make sure it doesn't want to be adjusted. Then out to my back. Nice stretch. Free happiness. And then to the front of my body with all the organs. As I go up, intestines, colon. I went the wrong way, and down. Go up, you get to the stomach, relaxing everything. To the lungs, to the heart. Wishing every part of my body peace and happiness. Just checking my relationship with these parts. Making peace, being kind and being gentle. And I go into my shoulders. I relax those muscles. So they feel loose. 
I often notice that when anybody is tight, like they're being stretched, held back in the past, they're being stretched into the future. It's like a guitar string, which is very tight. When something hits it, it resonates, makes a loud noise. When that guitar string is loose, something hits it, it doesn't make any sound at all. That's my simile for resilience. When you're stretched tight, stressed out, small things affect you. When you're really relaxed and loose, big thing hits you. You can let it go straight away. Some heavy object hits a loose string. It doesn't make any sound. I go down by arms. Sorry. Yes, yeah, right. Go down my arms. Pass my elbows to my hands. Making sure I've got a caring relationship even to my hands. Are you okay there? Anything you need? My hands relax. I enjoy that relaxation. When I look for the joy, it's, it's there. A great amount. Sometimes I ask myself, why do I miss that? Why, what, why am I afraid of experiencing joy and happiness? So I decide not to be afraid. And I move that back up to my neck, relaxing the neck to the max up to my face. I always spend moments on my face to loosen all those muscles around the eyes and the mouth. So nothing is tight at all. And the experience, the relationship I have to my body is one of care and gentleness and letting go. My body always feels so at ease. It is delightful. Now I look at the relationship I have to my inner world, my mind. I don't look upon the mind as being me. I look upon it like the body is something I live with, and the kind too. How peaceful are your mind? What can I do? my attitude, my relationship with you to make you more peaceful. And I learn from being in this moment, not trying to run away from things, but making peace with things. This object is the most important thing in the whole world to me, what I'm experiencing right in this moment. I'm going to stay with you, present moment. You give as much kindness and freedom as you want. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm just going to be with you. Being here, not going somewhere.
And I'm enjoying this moment so much. It's being with my mind. Being content with my mind. As it is. No measuring, no judging. So I don't need any future. I'm really happy just being here. And the feeling of joy and happiness and peace in this moment. It's really difficult to give it words, to give it a name. I trust the silence. I don't need to name things. I feel at ease in this beautiful, peaceful world without any names. It's like a silent movie. No thoughts, no descriptions. The peace and beauty of now describe itself. And I'm loose. I'm not holding on tightly, afraid of losing my mindfulness. I trust my mind. I trust enough this relationship which I'm building with my mind to totally let go. It's like I remember seeing a shopping center, a baby being held by its mum in one arm, and the other arm was pushing a shopping trolley. It was a very busy shopping center, and the baby was fast asleep in its mother's arms, totally trusting they would not be dropped. That sort of trust. You can let things be, knowing that you'll never be hurt. You have a good relationship to this moment in your meditation. I'm now going to be quiet again. Do that you enjoy building a trusting, peaceful relationship at this moment. So it's like sitting under the mango tree, perfectly still, opening up compassion, seeing what happens.
it's getting close to the end of this meditation. How do you feel about this? What is your relationship to this moment? Is it one of peace, kindness and gentleness? If it is, we will feel the result. This is meditation. Gorgeous. Real happiness. Real powerful awareness. It's inevitable that insights will come. Mangoes will fall. Not just one. Many into your hand. The path of the Buddha. So those who want to finish off the meditation, please, now's the time to open your eyes. And smile. For those of you who have the, the good fortune to be able to continue, carry it if you can. Just enjoy it to the max. And I'll see you this evening. This afternoon, I'll leave you with wise Ajahn Pamari. Bye.